Isn't that some great news? That as a believer, for sure, resurrection is in our future. And as a believer, our best days are ahead of us. As a believer, you have eternity to look forward to. And this is what we're doing today. Every time we come together as a church, we're reminding ourselves of our spiritual life. And we're also reminding ourselves of our eternal life. It's so easy to get caught up with the problems of today, the business of today, the, the accolades you're trying to accomplish, and forget about what the meaning of life is really about. You were created to have a relationship with God. And until you have that relationship with God, there'll be something missing. And I just pray today, if you feel like, man, there's something missing in my life, I got the answer for you, it's Jesus Christ. He's here for you and he loves you and he wants a relationship with you. So what does God want? A relationship with you. That's all he wants. He don't want anything else. He goes, I want to have a relationship with you. Just think about the creator of the universe is concerned about you. And the Bible says that he's so concerned about you and he's looking at you so precisely. Uh, he knows you better than you know you. And the Bible says that he knows you so well, he, know, he has the hairs on your head numbered. Well, that's something big deal for me. Come on, I'm, I'm losing hair every day. But he knows that what he's saying is, I got an eye on you and the little things matter to me. And right now you might have a big problem or a small problem. He said, well, I'm not going to give God those little things. God says, give me the little, give me the big, give me all of it. I'll help you. How many believe there's a real God that loves you and he wants to help you? Okay. Thank you everyone that tuned in online. I mean, we got a packed house today. We had already 116 people this service that got baptized. We have over 200 people. Get it. Let's give the Lord a hand. Come on, it's a big deal. There's probably not too many places in the world that 200 people are getting baptized. There's a revival happening right here in San Bernardino at the Way World. How many understand there's a revival happening right now? It's not a future revival. It's happening now. This is so good. We're going to be talking about, we're starting a series. It's a four-week series. And we're going to be talking about the end times. We're going to describe today, introduce you to the subject, what is the end times? Uh, you don't want to miss any one of the services. The difference between the Bible and every other book that you've read, most every other book doesn't have this. It doesn't have future events in it. Most, most books, most books might have some history in it, but they don't talk about the future. They talk about what has happened. Now, God, he doesn't live in the present. He doesn't live in the past. He doesn't live in the future. He lives out of time. What that means, he's above time. Here's present. Here's present, past, future, and he's above it all. So when God looks at the future, it's history to him. So in this book, the Bible, he's written not only about the past. He talks to you about the present, but he also talks to you about a future and today we're going to begin a subject about talking about the end times. Are we in the end times? And what about the future? And we're going to be talking about all of that in these next four weeks. And the, what you want to get out of this is get an eternal perspective. That you start looking at life through the way God looks at it. This life on earth, the Bible says it's, a, it's like a vapor. One second you're here, the next second you're gone. But you'll live forever. Just think about it. You're there for 10,000 years in eternity, and you just begun. Be careful that you're not trading in a short period of vapor for your eternity. We are here to remind ourselves, man, I need Jesus to save me. And if you're today, you're not sure, man, I'm not sure I'm saved. I don't even know what you're talking about. Well, by the end of the service, we're going to give you an opportunity to get some assurance. Not insurance, assurance. Someone say assurance. Not insurance, assurance that you're saved. Now, insurance, some of you guys have life insurance. I mean, the other day I went to get some sunglasses. They want to they wanna sell me a $20 gla my glasses insurance in case I get a scratch on it. Some of you guys got insurance for every, your stereo at home is insured. I mean, you got your house insured. You got all kinds of stuff insured, but you're not sure about your eternity. What a shame that would be that you insured everything, but you, wouldn't, you weren't assured assured about your eternal life. So let's pray. Father, we just thank you. I'm asking you, Lord, to teach us today. Help us to understand the Bible so we can understand it, apply it, and allow it to change our lives forever. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. So I'm going to give you an introduction to the end times or 
the last days. Say it with me, last days. The end times and last days refers to a period of time that precedes the second coming of Jesus Christ, the tribulation, and the final judgment of all people. It's three things we're talking about. Are they're going to happen in the future or near future? It's the second coming of Jesus Christ. We know he already came once, but he's coming back again. There's also going to be a tribulation time on this earth that we'll discuss next week. And we're not going to go in deep into detail on the tribulation. But I'm going to, next week, I'm going to give you a big overview of the, really, the book of Revelations. And you'll understand from where we're at now to the end of this world what's going to happen. But also, there's going to be a day of final judgment. There's going to be a day that every single one of us will be judged. Or in other words, sentenced. And once the sentence is done, it's over. What I mean by that is there's no, there's no fight in the case. If the sentence has been declared over you, innocent or guilty, if you're innocent because Jesus saved you, you will spend the rest of your eternity with Jesus Christ in a place where there's no more pain, there's no more suffering, there's no more, no more devil, no more addiction. All these things that we experience here will be gone forever. And you'll be with the Lord. But if you're guilty, you'll be eternally separated from God forever and ever. Now, why do we study the end times? Two reasons. Reason number one, the Bible says a lot about the end times or the last days. God doesn't want us unaware of the times we're living in and what is coming. He, God is saying, I know what's coming, and I don't want you to be surprised. I'm going to talk to you about the last days. In 2 Timothy 3, 1, look what it says. You may as well know this too. I want you to know this too, Timothy, or he's talking to us, that in the last days, say it with me again, in the last days, it's going to be very difficult to be a Christian. If you're a believer in these days, it's a, it's a lot more difficult to live for God than it was maybe in the 50s or the 60s or the 70s. I don't even see the 80s. We're living in a time that's almost like we're in a post-Judeo-Christian world. We used to say, in God we trust. I remember when I was a little boy, we used to wake, I mean, as soon as we got to class, we'd put our, our, our hands on our chest and, and, and just proclaim the Pledge of Allegiance to the United States of America, right? And we would pledge allegiance to our country. We would say, in God we trust. God bless America. But now we've taken prayer out of school. We no longer value the Bible. And for some of us, we're actually thinking the Bible is not relevant for today. Now, just because we've changed the way we determine our values, because today, values and morals are based on subjection. What I mean by that is I choose what my values are. I choose my reality and I choose my truth. But the reality is you don't choose your reality. You don't choose your truth. Truth has already been written. Now we could go ahead and rewrite it, but it doesn't mean it's true. If you go into university today, they actually teach you there's no absolutes. We used to teach foundational principles of God. We used to use the Bible as the foundation of our decisions. We still, when we're actually swearing in a, a, a president, he still puts his hand on the Bible. It's still there, but the problem is we're putting that, our hands on the Bible, but we don't believe it anymore. But the reality is everything that's been written in the Bible that was supposed to happen has happened except the prophetic things, future. Those things will definitely happen. Let's look at the scripture. In the last days, it's going to be very difficult to be a Christian. Right now, there's persecution for being a Christian. Right now, there's a lot of resistance if you're standing up for the word of God and the truths in scripture. In China, in December 2020, Chinese authorities raided a Christian church and arrested over 100 members, including the pastor. These things are happening right now. In Nigeria, 
Boko Haram militants attacked a group of Christian farmers in the northeastern state of Brno, killing at least 76 people. Imagine 76 people killed and we know nothing about it. If it was any other segment of society that people are actually being killed for their faith, there'd be an uproar. But yet Christians are being killed and it doesn't even make the news. Let's take a look at this. In North Korea, April 21st, 2021, it was reported a North, North Korean Christian was publicly executed for owning a Bible. They use him as an example. You own a Bible, we're going to publicly execute you to make sure everybody gets the point. You cannot own a Bible in this country. These things are happening now. And we're going to get to the point, it's going to become more and more difficult to be a Christian that lives for, come on, that lives for Jesus and uses the Bible as their morality. How many understand? It's going to get more difficult, but there's a group of people that don't care about that. I don't care how difficult it is. I'm living for Jesus. Is there anybody like that? So the Bible says a lot about the end times, the last days. Number two reason why we study the end times is to make sure that we and others are ready. The more the majority of people are unaware what is coming and are not ready for the second coming of Jesus and judgment. Most people are so consumed with the world and everyday life that they don't, they're not, they're not preparing for death and eternity. I remember as a little boy, because we used to study a lot about the end times, back in the day in churches, the end times was a major subject. There was an awareness and a fear of God that Jesus could come back anytime, and I just want to make sure I'm ready. I was so aware of that, that if I'd come home and I would say, Mom, and she wouldn't answer, I'd freak out. <laughs> I was aware that, I remember one time I came home and I was a teenager, and I came home and I saw, she, had, she was cooking something on the stove. And I could, it was, it was actually, it was actually being, it was burning and it was, it was actually boiling over. And I said, mom, I'm, I'm a teenager. I was trying to be cool at the beginning. <laughs> mom, she didn't answer. She didn't answer. By the fourth time I said, mom, <laughs> I was almost crying. She was somewhere in the back. That's where she was. And she goes, I'm right here. I go, all right. I didn't let her know I was freaking out. I thought Jesus came out. I got left behind. I knew I wasn't living right. <laughs> it's okay to have an awareness and also have a healthy fear that if Jesus were to come back, that you make sure that you're living right. You wouldn't be, want to be caught practicing sin when Jesus comes back. Make sure you live a life that's aware of your eternal life and it's aware that Jesus Christ can come back at any time as a believer. How many understand that? Look at this in Luke 21, 34. Be careful not to spend your time having parties and getting drunk or worrying about this life. If you do that, you won't be able to think straight. I love that scripture. If you're getting drunk and you're partying, you're getting high and all you're doing is worrying, we know this, you ain't thinking straight. And the end might come when you're not ready. Now the end is going to come. The question is, when he comes, will you be ready? Do you remember playing the game hide and seek when you were a little boy? Some of you guys are still playing that. <laughs> ready or not, here I come. There's going to be a day. Ready or not, here I come. The end times is a time that precedes the second coming of Jesus Christ. Are we in the end times? By the time we're done with this series, you're going to absolutely know that we are in the end times. In the Bible, it has signs that you would, the precursors, there would be alarms to tell us, if you see this, you're in the end times. And the more you know the Bible, you would understand this. The signs of the end times have never been more prevalent. 
We are in those last days. Jesus Christ can come at any time. And you're saying, well, he might not come at any time, but there's other thing. You could die at any time. You must be aware of your mortality. You must be aware that there will be an end of your life, but you also must be aware that there'll be a, an, an end of this world. Let's continue reading. Spending our time partying. It, it, it will come as a surprise. Look, no, no. If you, if you do that, you won't be able to think straight. The end might come when you're not ready. Verse 35. It will come as a surprise to everyone on earth. Now, when this day comes, it's going to be almost unexpected. It was like that in the days of Noah. We know and scientists know that at one time, this earth was covered with, wa with water, the whole earth. Noah was warned. And God said, I'm going to destroy the earth because of the sin and the wickedness that's on earth. And he warns them because it took them 120 years to build the boat or the ark. The people were thinking, oh yeah, rain, what is that? Because it never rained until that day it rained and flooded the whole earth. Water, water used to come from the bottom of the earth and water all the plants. But Moses was talking about a day that they've never seen was coming. The day would rain. Now, Every one of us have to understand this. The day is coming. Jesus Christ is coming back. And whether you believe it or not, it's going to happen. And when it started raining, Noah and his family and all the animals got in the boat. And when they got in the boat, the door shut. And God shut the door. And once the door was shut, everyone was trying to open it, but it was too late. You don't ever want to be in the position that Jesus Christ comes back and you're left behind. You don't want to be in a position that you leave this earth without a relationship with Jesus Christ. The pain, the hurt, the suffering, the addictions, the cycles of self-destruction you're in. I got some good news. That can be turned around. You can be saved. There could be an exchange. You give them your, come on, you give them your pain. You give them your depression. You give them your loneliness. You give them your confusion. And he'll give you his life. And he'll give you his peace. And he'll give you eternal life. The exchange can happen today. And you could leave this room knowing if Jesus Christ were come to come today, I'm saved. And I'd go with him. But could it be that you're the one that's not prepared, and you're just interested in getting drunk, getting high, partying, and you're thinking, not today. I got some partying to do today, maybe tomorrow. That kind of mindset might exclude you from eternity forever. Today's the day to get this stuff together. And if you find yourself living for a weekend, Let's end that mindset and start living for eternity. Because I guarantee if you do that, you're going to really enjoy life. So what is the most significant event that has ever happened in the history of the world? Good question. What is the most significant event that has ever happened in the history of the world? The answer, Jesus' birth. This event was so significant that history has now record, is now recorded by two time periods, B.C. and A.D. Before Jesus was born, the Bible prophesied he would be born. B.C. means before Christ. Say it with me. B.C. means what? So right now, if you go to school, there's two, there's, they're going to teach you this. There's B.C. and A.D. Jesus was... So powerful, so impactful, that when he came and he was born, he split time in half. Time started over. Out of the billions of people that have ever lived, no one did that. He fulfilled a prophecy that he would come, die, and resurrect from the dead. There were over 300 prophecies before Jesus showed up. 
written in the Bible that Jesus would come. And he came exactly the way the Bible said he would come. Let's read one of the prophecies in Isaiah 7, 14. All right, then, the Lord himself will give you the sign. The Lord himself will give you the sign. Look, the virgin will conceive a child. She will give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. And what does Emmanuel mean? It means God is with us. This was prophesied 700 years before Jesus was born. It's kind of like in a position we're in today where right now the prophecy is Jesus is coming back. They were in the, they were in the same place we're at, but they were waiting for the first coming. We're waiting for the second coming. And while they were waiting, many people were totally unaware. And when he came, they missed it. But the reality is, after he came, the world knew he came because he was the first man ever born without a sin nature. He was born with a God nature because this is what happened when he was conceived. He was not conceived by a man. He was conceived by the Spirit of God. So when he came to earth, he did miracles like no man ever did. He died. He resurrected from the dead. He taught in a way that no one has ever taught. And after they saw his life, they said, yes, this is the one that was God with us. We know. It's history. The time after Jesus was born is referred to now A.D. Now, some people think it means after death, but it doesn't mean that. It's a Latin word, anno domini, and means which, which is a Latin word which represents the year of the Lord and is used to refer the period of time that started after his birth, the birth of Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world. The year 1 A.D., is considered to be the year of Jesus Christ's birth. 1 AD is the year of Jesus Christ's birth. What year are we in? 2023 AD. What year are we in? The world knows that Jesus was born. The world knows that Jesus was born of a virgin. Look what the scripture says here in Matthew 1:18. This is how Jesus the Messiah was born. His mother Mary was engaged. It's a prophecy that actually happened. Married to jo was engaged to be married to Joseph. But before the marriage took place, while she was still a virgin, she became pregnant through the power of the Holy Spirit. We know this. You cannot get pregnant as a virgin. How many of you understand that? You can so if, if, some, if your daughter tells you, I, I, I just, I, I was a vir I, I'm a virgin still, and she's pregnant, I understand this is not the Holy Spirit. <laughs> There's only one person that's ever been born from the seed of God. And you could see it in his lifestyle. And because he came, and it's obvious that he came, and he was the Savior, and he was the Messiah, and he was God with us, everyone knew it's it. He's the one. There's been no one like him. He not only lived, but he died and he resurrected from the dead. No one has ever done that. Even the Quran, which I'm not, I am not endorsing the Quran, but even the Quran, and they have a scripture in the Surah Ali Imran, it says in the Surah Al Imran, it says, it's, uh, Surah Al Imran 347 describes the angel Gabriel announcing that Mary will conceive a child despite being a virgin. Now, why would God allow this truth to be put in the Quran? Because he has so much mercy and he has so much love that he doesn't want the Muslim to, to miss the most important event that's ever hit on this earth, that Jesus was born of a virgin, that he's the savior of the world, because they look at it, they read it, they believe it, and no one has ever been born like that, including Muhammad. Muhammad was born a sinner. And the difference between Muhammad and Jesus is a big difference. Jesus was born of a virgin. Muhammad wasn't. G Muhammad died and he's still in the grave. Jesus died, 
and he conquered the grave. He's alive, and he's a source of eternal life, your Savior. So what is the most significant event that will happen in the future of the world? So we already know the most important event that has happened is Jesus' birth. When I was born in, on April 21st, 1967, believe it or not, and when I was born, time did, just, did not stop. They should have started over when I was born. But understand this, you were born, and you know how old you are, Base time didn't start over when you were born. There's only one person out of the billions of people that have hit this earth that stopped time and made us begin to count one, two, three again because he stopped time because the Savior was born. That period of time before Christ has ended and now we're talking about a new period of time. It's called the church age. But there's a, but there's a new period of time coming and that's after Jesus comes back. I don't know what that time is going to be called. It could be after the rapture, ATR. It might be right around the corner, but we know this, Jesus is coming back. How many believe that Jesus Christ is coming back? Came once, he's coming back. The Bible prophesies the second coming of Jesus Christ. Just like it was prophesied that Jesus would come the first time, and it happened, the second coming of Christ will also happen. There's not one scripture, one promise in the Bible that will not come to pass. Because it wasn't written by men, it was written by God. And there's something that you can do that God can't do. God cannot lie. What he, when he says it, it's done. And the Bible prophesies about Jesus Christ coming back. In Acts 1.11, look what it says, men of Galilee, an angel spoke this. They said, why are you standing here, look, staring into the heaven, in, into heaven? Jesus was taken from you into heaven. But someday he will return from heaven in the same way you saw him go. So the disciples were spending time with Jesus after he resurrected from the dead. The Bible describes Jesus spending 40 days on this earth after he resurrected from his dead, given his disciples' last moment instructions. He was letting them know, I'm alive, and here are the final instructions. But the final instructions were finally over, and he ascended, they call it ascension, he ascended into heaven. They're talking to him, and he just started flying into heaven. So the disciples are looking at him, and he's getting smaller and smaller as he's going, and and the angel finally stops. Why are you looking into the sky? He's gone. But one day, he's coming back the same way he left. Jesus is coming back. Come on, he's coming back in the clouds one day to come and get believers. Come on, are you going to be ready for that day? How many believe we need to be talking about this kind of stuff? And the reason we need to be talking about this stuff, because it's going to happen. One day I'm going to stand before God and I'm going to give an account for every sermon that I give. And I love you so much, I want you to be in heaven with me. What a shame that I'd be preparing you for tomorrow. I'd be preparing you for today and you're overcoming your obstacles and you're winning in life, but you don't win for eternity. We have to talk about these things so we can start getting an internal perspective. But not only that, it's going to help you get ready and also put a sense of urgency to make sure your friends, your family, your brothers, your sisters, your children are ready. Come on, let's get the per eternal perspective. There's one thing we can't do in heaven, and that's tell people about Jesus. We can't save souls. We can't warn people in heaven. It's too late. Someday he will return. Number two, Jesus himself said, we're talking about the second coming, that he is coming back for all believers. In John 14, 2, Jesus said this, there is more than enough room in my father's home. If this were not so, would I have told you that I'm going to prepare a place for you? I love this. So when Jesus left, he goes, you know where I'm going? I'm going to go prepare a place for you. I'm going to play a, 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 prepare a place. 
just imagine this earth was created in six days. Imagine what God's creating for us for eternity. Have you ever gone to Hawaii? It's beautiful over there. Have you gone to Puerto Rico? I'm from Puerto Rico. It's beautiful over there, but it's going to be nothing compared to heaven. Come on. It's going to be, come on, paradise. No, man, no death, no suffering. Come on, no growing old. Come on, no, no arthritis, no sickness. And we're going to be there forever and ever. Come on, no devil, no temptation, no bad days, joy, peace, forever and ever. You could get through the difficulties now because I got some good news for you. It doesn't end here. The best for a believer is yet to come. Give God some praise that he's gone to prepare a place for us. Now, look, when everything's ready, I love it. You know what? I, what? Sometimes I don't have patience to wait for the meal. Like, I want the meal done yesterday. When we go home, I'm going to be hungry. I already know. I haven't ate since yesterday. But I already know this. There's nothing going to be cooked. <laughs> so, uh, I'm, where's Lisa? Oh, she's back there. We're, all, we're good. All right. Because in order for me to eat today, Lisa would have to cook, cook last night. So we have little, little like, little leftovers. So this is what's going to happen. I, I already know that she's going to cook some stew. And we bought the meat Friday. And we were supposed to cook it on Saturday. But we got, or we got, we got too busy. So you know what's going to have to happen? I'm going to have to sit there at home hungry until she cooks that thing. All, I, all I'm saying is there's a day coming. And, and right now, when everything's ready, come and get it. I will come and get you. Come on. When everything's ready, Lisa says, it's done. Ah, come on, baby. But there's going to be a day when everything's ready, everything's prepared. He goes, I got everything set. The last person got saved, and I'm coming to get you, and I'm going to deliver you out of this world, and I'm going to take you to a perfect place that will never end. Come on, give God some praise that life is bigger than this moment here. You know what's going to happen? Everybody in heaven is going to be rich. The streets in heaven are made of gold. Trip out. It's going to be awesome. There's going to be no need. There's going to be no homelessness. There's going to be no struggle. There'll be no abuse. All that stuff. There'll be no death. All that stuff will finally end. People ask me, Pastor Marco, why is there so much bad in this world? And I'll tell you why there's so much bad in this world. Because we're here and we're sinners. And there's a real devil. But there's going to be a day where the devil is going to, come on, be put away once and for all. We're going to be, come on, we're going we're gonna to shed off this sin nature. And we're going to a place, come on, where there's no evil, there's no anger, there's no pain. And we'll live in that place forever and ever. Come on, are you living for eternity? When everything's ready, I'll come and get you. Look at this. So that you will always be with me where I am now. You know what this says? All God is saying, you know what I want? I want you to be with me forever. I'm preparing this place so me and you can live forever. My goal, God said, my goal, my mission is you. All God wants is a relationship with you. Say, Pastor, man, I'm a sinner. I've messed up. God says, don't worry about that. I already sent my son to pay the price for all your guilt and shame. Stop living in your past. Come on, stop living in your guilt. You could be forgiven. You could have a brand new start. And you could enter a relationship with a God that wants a relationship with you. I love it. The next thing, number three. The first time, we're talking about the second coming. The first time Jesus came, he came as a savior. The second coming, he is coming as a judge. Now that's different. 
Now, we love talking about the grace of God, the mercy of God, the love of God, but we don't want to talk about judgment. There'll be a time where your time runs out. If you never gave your life to Jesus, if you had faith in a religion, that's not going to save you. If you had faith in your own good works, that's not going to save you because salvation is a gift that you receive by believing. It's available right now. The work is already done. That means all your part is just to believe and trust Jesus, turn away from your sin, and place your faith in Jesus, and God gives you the free gift of eternal life. Give God some praise. It's already been paid for. The meal has been paid for. 2 Thessalonians 1, 7, look what it says. And 9. And God will provide rest for you who are being persecuted and also for us when the Lord Jesus appears from heaven. He's coming. He will come with his mighty angels. He's not coming riding on a donkey. He's coming riding on the wings of heaven with his mighty strong angels. Look at this. In flame and fire, bringing judgment on those who do not, don't know God, on those who refuse to obey the good news of Jesus Christ, our Lord Jesus Christ. They will be punished with eternal destruction, forever separated from the Lord and from his glorious power. No matter how bad things are today, there's hope for you. You can call on Jesus, he can help you. But there will be a time after judgment that there's no calling on Jesus. There's no, you're separated from the power of God. You're separated from the mercy of God. You're separated from the love of God forever and ever. And there's nothing you can do to turn it around. The time to get saved is right now. I, I'm, I get claustrophobic. I don't, does anybody get claustrophobic? I, this is what happened. One day we were at a hotel and there was people trapped in the elevator for two hours. Like, I was thinking if I was then, I'd be going crazy. They were in there. Imagine just one person with a panic attack in there. Going crazy in there. And you can't get out, and you don't know when you're going to get out. But the truth is, they're going to get them out. But imagine being in a place like that, confined in darkness, with no breath. You can't breathe. There's no hope. In utter darkness, weeping, gnashing of teeth, in such anguish, and you can't get out eternally separated from the blessings of God, the love of God, the joy of God, the peace of God, the hope of God. This is why Jesus had to come and die for our sins because the price for sin is that serious. It's either you're saved by placing your faith in Jesus Christ or you're eternally separated from Jesus forever. This is something we got to think about. How many understand that? And the fourth thing I want to talk about the second coming, the time to get ready for the, for the second coming is right now. You know, when I was looking at scripture, why would you refuse to believe? Why would we refuse to receive the gift of forgiveness and eternal life? Why? There's only one reason. We love our sin so much we don't want to let it go. The reason people are atheists or agnostics is because of this idea. I don't want to be accountable to a God that has standards, so I want to eliminate him. So I can continue living my life according to my ways with no consequences. But the reality is you could put your head in the sand like an ostrich. It doesn't mean the lion's not coming. The Bible says there's a way that seems right unto a man, but at least to death and destruction. And let's just talk about basic logic. I was looking at Pierce Morgan the other day, and they had the top atheist that was in conversation with him. And Pierce Morgan just said, "Um, how did everything begin? And how do you answer everything coming from nothing? And the top atheist said, we don't have an answer for that. And he said, just because we don't have an answer for that doesn't mean 
by default, it's God. He wants to ignore that there's a creator. But yet, we know this, that everything you're wearing was created. Some of, some of you are, have a brand on you, and you bought that brand because it means something you liked. You liked the designer. But the truth is, where there's design, there was a designer. So now, if you don't believe in a creator, what do you believe? That everything came out of nothing that disorder created order. I'm talking about, let's just be logical. Because if you do not believe in God, this is what you're saying as a creator, you believe in a big bang theory. But I just said it, theory. And it's, a, it's not science, it's theory. And when was the last time you blew up something and after you blew it up, it was in perfect, perfect order? Let's create a building. Let's just start blowing up stuff. Eventually, we'll have the Wayroll Outreach. Explosions don't create order. Explosions create disorder. But yet, we love our sin so much. I'm going to tell you this. It takes more faith to be an atheist than to believe that there's a God that created you and me in this perfect world. How many understand there's some perfection in this world? order in this world that really works. So now, the time to get ready for the second coming is now. Say it with me, now. now. Revelation 6, 16, 15, behold, this is Jesus, I'm coming like a thief. Now, Jesus said, didn't say, I'm a thief. I'm coming like a thief. What that means, the thief doesn't announce when he's coming. He don't say, hey, you know, um, at 2 o'clock in the morning, I'm going to go through the back door and I'm going to rip off your jewelry. Because if he told you, you'd have, come on, you'd have the police there. You'd, come on, some of you guys would have your pistola out. I mean, me? I would have my, 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 my bully right there. I dare you to come in my room. My dog would just eat him alive. You know, Jesse, one of our members here, he's an electrician, and he might be here in the service. He came to my house. And, and, I, and he, he has bullies like mine. And he, he said, um, Pastor Mark, I'm really good with dogs. I go, okay. I go, my dog, he's, like, he's unpredictable. I don't know if he's going to get you or not. But I don't trust him. He goes, I'm like a dog whisperer. Don't bring him. So my dog comes and he's just wagging his tail. I go, oh, maybe he is. I'm, and all of a sudden my dog just stops. Looks at him, don't bark nothing, and then just jumps and grab, tries to grab his neck. Jesse's a slow motion going like this. Matrix, it bites his chest, rips his shirt, and Jesse runs inside the house. And he's Mexican, but he turned white. I go, I to, I go Jesse, I told you, man. I thought crazy. All I'm saying... No thief's going to come to my house and tell me when he's coming and rip me off. But what God is saying, when I'm coming, there's going to be no notice. The only notice you got right now is that he is coming and be ready. Come on, be ready in season. Be ready in out of season. Always live a life of awareness. Look at this. Bro, I'm coming like a thief. Blessed is he who stays awake, who keeps his clothes, that is, stays spiritually ready for the Lord's return so that he will not be naked or it means spiritually unprepared. Jesus says he's coming in one chapter in Revelation 22. He says it three times. He goes, look, I'm coming soon. That's Revelation 22, 7. Revelation 22, 12. Look, I'm coming soon. Bring in my reward with me to repay all people according to their deeds. Revelation 20, 20. He is faithful. He is a faithful witness to all these things. Yes, I'm coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. And this is what we're saying. The prepared say, God, Jesus says, I'm coming soon. You say, amen, come. We're ready. Is there anybody who could say amen? Come on, come, Jesus. We're ready for you. But if you're saying in this room, Jesus, don't come right now. <laughs> we ain't ready. That's all right, because we could get ready this moment. If right now you're saying, Pastor, I'm not ready for the second coming. This is why we're talking about it. I love you. This could be the last Sunday we talk about this because Jesus could come at any time. 
I'll end it with this last verse. Matthew 25, 13. So you too, you too, you too, must keep watch, be aware. For you do not know the day or the hour of my return. Now I want you to, all right, there it goes. He's right there, the trumpet just hit. There's going to be a trumpet blown that day. Not that one, but it's going to be another one. And when he comes, imagine if he came this morning. Those who are saved will be caught up in the air with them. There's going to be a mass disappearance in the way we're all outreach. But wouldn't it be jacked up that you're trying to jump and you can't go nowhere? You get left behind because you are not ready. He's coming back for believers. He's coming back for the saved. And today, my responsibility as a pastor is to let you know Jesus Christ is coming back. And my responsibility is to do everything I can to help you get ready for that. Now, there's three groups of people here. There are those, they're coming here for the first time in church, you've never been part of church. But you know this, what we talked about does make sense because we see BC, we see AD, and it's all around one person, Jesus, and that's undeniable. He was so important that we have before Christ and the year of the Lord after he was born. And every day we're riding the date, we're reminding ourselves, this is 2,023 years after Jesus was born. I can't deny it, it's part of my life. And you also realize, wait a second, it makes sense that there's a creator if there's a creation. Just like if there's an art piece, there must be an artist. If there's a design, there must be a designer. And you're thinking, that makes sense too. And then there's another thing about you that you know about yourself, that eternity is in your heart. And what I mean by that is there's a sense of awareness that you are more than your body. God has put eternity in your heart. And that's why when I do funerals, and I've been doing them for uh, 20, 20 plus years, and every funeral I go to, everyone says this, they're in a better place. No one has ever said they're in a state of nothingness. I've never heard it. Oh yeah, they're in a state of, that never said that because deep down inside of us, we know that there's eternity. And all I'm saying, these are facts. And God loves you, and that's a fact. And Jesus Christ died for your sins, and that's a fact. And he resurrected from the dead to give you a new life, and that's a fact. And, and all you need to do is come the way you are, and that's a fact. And he'll forgive you of everything you've done, and that's a fact. And he'll give you a gift of eternal life, and that's a fact. And he'll set you free from whatever addiction, and that's a fact. Come on, he'll exchange your depression for, come on, for his joy, and that's a fact. Come on, he'll exchange your anxiety for his peace, and that's a fact. And the other fact is, you don't know what tomorrow holds. That's a fact. Some of you might not even make it past this week. Pastor, are you trying to scare me? I'm just trying to scare the hell out of you. <laughs> Come on, I don't want you to go to hell. I'm just trying to scare you right out of you. I love you. But I think sometimes we need a dose of reality. And, 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 and you're sitting here, even if you're here for the first time, you're like, this makes sense. This is, not, this is not crazy stuff. Like, this all makes sense. And I'm telling you, God loves you. And all he wants is a relationship with you. And you don't fix your life and come to Jesus, just like you don't fix your car before you take it to the mechanic. You come with your broken down heart, life, marriage, emotions, and God does the healing and God does the fixing. He's not here to judge you. He's here to save you. But one day he's going to come to judge. Not right now. He's coming to save. Let's not be like the Noah generation that ignores the preaching for 120 years and get left behind. Today's your day. Are you ready to make a decision to turn away from doing life your way and that's called your sin and follow Jesus and receive the free gift of forgiveness and eternal life? You could have it today. You know what I would love? 
for you to know when you leave here, say, man, that was awesome. And I know this, if Jesus were to come back this afternoon, I know I'm saved. I received Jesus as my Lord and Savior. So now, there's three people. One, you're here and you've never given your life to Jesus and Jesus is knocking at your heart's door. He's saying, will you let me in? I want to come in and have a relationship with you. I want to, I want to fill you with my spirit to make you into a new person, to empower you to do what you've always wanted to do. I'm going to help you overcome what's been overcoming you. And I'm going to give you the gift of eternal life. There's another group that you're a Christian, but you, you, you like need to come back home. The devil spoke to you and you followed him and you've been following him. But I know this, if you're a Christian and you gave your life to Jesus and you followed the devil, I know this, you're the most miserable person in this room. There's no, more, there's no one more miserable than the believer that walked away. Because you know, like, what am I doing? It's time for you to come back home. Is God mad at you? No. He loves you. Can't wait for you to come back home. He has open arms. Come on, son. Come on, daughter. I'll forgive you. Number, and number three, there's another group that you're like, I don't know. Maybe, maybe not. I don't know. I'm not sure if Jesus would come back right now or I would have died, go to heaven. But I want to make sure. I'm going to count to three. You're a decision away. Jesus is knocking your heart's door. Now, you could keep the door closed, act like you're not home. Have you ever done that? Like someone knocks on the door, put down the curtains. <laughs> right? Back in the day, the phones used to ring like, ring, ring. Anybody ever had a, a phone on you know, like, ring? And then, but, you, but the problem is there was no caller ID. It was like, you didn't know who was calling. So you'd always answer the phone. Hola? Like, you don't, like you're not sure who's calling, you just all of a sudden you learn Spanish. Hola, como estas? <laughs> just in case. It's that person you don't want to talk to, right? But, I, but then you would answer it, and then they say, Who is it? It's Uncle John. Tell him I'm not here. <laughs> Tell him. You have your kids lie. Mama is not here. Uh, he didn't... He, Don't do that to Jesus. Don't act like he's not talking to you. His love is knocking on our heart's door. Give your life to Jesus. Open your heart. This is what I've learned. Everyone that gives their life to Jesus only say this. Why didn't I do it earlier? What was I waiting for? Today's your day of salvation. He loves you. I love you, right? That's why I'm talking about the truth here. How many are ready to come the next four weeks? Come on, it's going to be awesome. Or... We're going to be talking next week, next week about seven major prophetical events. Seven things are going to happen, including a seven-year tribulation, three-and-a-half-year reign of the Antichrist, the mark of the beast, and the lake of fire, and the new world, new world and new earth, new earth and new heavens that are coming. It's going to be crazy. I'm going to show you when it's going to happen, okay, next week. But if you're saying that's me, Pastor, I'm one of those three people. I'm not sure I'm right with God. I came here for the first time, but I want to receive Jesus as my Lord and Savior, or... I need to come back home. When I say three, I want you to raise your hands. One, I'm not even asking you to bow your heads and close your eyes, but I learned this. If you're ashamed to raise your hand here, you'll never live for Jesus out there. Jesus didn't die privately. He died publicly for you. And he said, I'm doing this because I love you. Come on. Is there anybody bold enough to say, man, I need some change in my life. I want to be forgiven. I want to be saved. One, two, when I say three, I want you to raise your hand. One, two, three. Right now, raise your hand. I want to give my life to Jesus. I'm not sure I'm right. I want to recommit my life to the Lord. I see the hand. I see the hand. Proud of you. I'm proud of you. Proud of you. I'm proud of you. Proud of you. I see the hand. I see the hand there. Come on, anybody else? I see the hand. I see the hand. I see the hand. Way in the back. God bless you. I see the hand there. Raise your hand. Come on. Keep your hands raised. Keep your hands raised. I want to see. I see those hands there. I see the hand over there. I want those that raise their hand. Do me one big favor. Stand up where you're at. This is your first step of following Jesus. Come on. Just stand up where you're at. Just say, I'm ready. I'm going to stand for Jesus. I'm going to live for him. I want to be forgiven. I want eternal life. And I want everybody to stand with him. Come on, everybody stand with him. Those that, raise, those that stood up and raised your hands, I want you to do me one more favor. I want to pray with you. Will you give me the honor and privilege to pray with you? 
and leading you in a prayer to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior so you could be forgiven and have a new life. If you say, if you raise your hands and you stood up, come forward real quick. Just come up here real fast. I'm going to pray with you. We're not going to embarrass you. We're just going to pray. Come on. We're going to receive Jesus. This is your first step of leaving your addiction, leaving your pain, leaving your past. Come on, in that seat. Religion can't save you, but Jesus can. Come on, there's somebody else. Ask your neighbor. If you want to go up there, I'll go up there with you. There's somebody right now that you're in this seat. Your heart is, your heart is pounding, and this might be your last opportunity. Jesus spoken to you. Don't resist him. Accept him. Come on. He's knocking your heart's door. Don't act like you don't hear him. He loves you. pray. Come on church, let's give them a hand. People are giving their lives to Jesus. Come on, that's good news. We live for this. All right. They're still coming. Come on, they're still coming. They're giving their lives to Jesus. Come on, people just like us. Nobody's better than nobody. We need Jesus. All right. Next week, you don't want to miss it. We just talked about the second coming, but next we're going to talk about seven prophetical events that are going to happen in the future. The week after that, we're going to talk about signs that were in the last days. You don't want to miss this. It's going to be awesome. But I'm proud of every one of you here. Now, no matter what you've done, Jesus loves you and he wants to forgive you. Now, you have to be willing to do this break up with your sin like I'm done doing it my way you know what your sin is it's that thing you keep going to other than God to give you an escape and every one of us have those pet sins or those escape things we go to and that, that thing that you've been going to makes you think you can't live without it how are you going to live without it it's your escape it's what comforts you and you've been going to it and going to it and going to it. And now it's actually, and you be saying, I'm not addicted. You are. Because you can't stop. There's some promises that you made to yourself that you'll never do it again. And you find yourself doing it again. And, and we've all been there. Like, we say, Pastor, how do you know? Because I know me. And if I know me, I know you because we're human. And the truth is, you can't heal your heart. You can't set yourself free, but Jesus can. Who the Son says free is free for real. He'll set you free. Are you ready to give up your addiction? Come on, are you ready to give up your anger? Are you ready to give up the depression? Are you ready to give up the pornography? Are you ready to give up the weed? Are you ready to give up the alcoholism? You got to give it up. Because this idea, God doesn't fill full cups. You got to be willing to empty it so you can fill it. It's your day. But I'm telling you, whatever you give up is nothing compared to what you're going to get. You've been trying to find fulfillment and wholeness and love in all the wrong places and all the wrong things. And you know, the more you go around the, right, right around that lap, it gets worse. Every, every cycle, it gets worse. And you're thinking, man, I know what to do. If I just get rid of her and I bring her in, we'll be good. You're lying to yourself. If I go to weed from weed and if I just get some meth, but that'll fix, that'll fix everything. What? You won't. It's not going to fix it. Whatever you got, whatever emptiness is inside of your heart, only Jesus can fix it. I'm telling you, give your life toys to Jesus and experience the fullness of God. I'm telling you, he loves you. Let's do this. Come on. I'm going to be here. I'm going to be here until Jesus comes back. So let's do this. You got some real family here. We're not going nowhere. And we love you, we care about you, and we're going to train you how to live for God. It takes a real man and woman to live for God. Anybody could just go out there and just live like, like hell out there. But live for God, it takes somebody like, I'm serious, I'm going to live for God. And I'm proud of every one of you. Are you ready to surrender it all? And if you surrender, God will take it, and then he'll give you an exchange. Come on. Your weakness for his strength. Come on. Your depression for his joy. Your addiction for his freedom. Come on, let's make the deal. Let's make the deal, all right? Let's pray.
Let's pray together. Repeat after me these words. Say, say, Jesus, thank you for loving me and not giving up on me. I know that I'm a sinner that deserves judgment. But I believe you love me so much you were punished for all the wrong I've done so that I could be forgiven. And then you rose from the dead for me to give me new life. Today, I make a decision to repent of my sins, to follow you for the rest of my life. I open my heart and I ask you now, come in and make me a new person. Fill me now with your spirit. Forgive me, Lord, for all the wrong I've done. I receive your forgiveness. And I forgive myself. Thank you, Jesus. Today, I'm saved. I have eternal life. I'm a new person today. In Jesus' name, I thank you. And I pray. Amen. Let's give the Lord a big hand. Come on. We love you. Your next step is baptism. Holy Warriors this Tuesday.